So who actually came to my talk yesterday, Web Rebels? Okay, it's about, this talk is about twice as silly as that, so definitely put your seatbelts on if there's anything to go by. Um, for everyone else, hey everybody, my name is Suze Hinton. Um, my talk is Don't Delete the Data Sheet. I'm gonna be talking about writing hardware libraries with JavaScript today, so it's slightly different to yesterday's topic. So my name is Suze Hinton. Um, you can find me at Noobcat on GitHub and Twitter and all sorts of other social media avenues. Um, as Richie said, I live in New York City. Um, I actually work at Kickstarter, the company, so I'm um, usually backing all the things. Um, so if you ever want to know cool things to back, check out my profile. It's Noobcat on Kickstarter. Um, so today I wanted to share with you some of the things I learned the hard way through trying to write a JavaScript hardware driver of sorts. Um, and I'm not going to share all of it because I've only got half an hour, but I'm going to do my best to teach you all that I found out. So what you're looking at on the screen right now is a small collection of devices that I keep buying in order to create this side project that I've been wanting to do for about five years. And everyone's got that project, right? They, they, you just want to start on something and it, everything has to be perfect before you start, so you never start it. Um, so this is a bunch of screens, uh, lights, uh, breakout boards, and uh, microcontrollers because I want to make my own watch. And I think it would be exaggerating to call it a smart watch because it's not going to be very smart. <laughs> but I do you know, want to make my own to, to kind of learn from that process. And so these are some of the prototyping uh, gadgets that I've accumulated since trying to do that. Um, and so I eventually settled on this screen here um, to do the watch. It's called an OLED screen or an OLED screen. Um, if anyone's got a Fitbit, like whether they've got the wrist one or the, the hip one, uh, it actually uses a very, very similar screen. What's good about them is that they're really low power um, and they, they only use the, like the pixels showing on the screen, it actually correlates to how much power it's using. So you can actually like juggle your power usage based on how many pixels you're showing. So normally when I want to create something in robotics, and Magnus brought it up earlier, and someone showed me this amazing bell ringing device at lunchtime. Every time they get a sale, it rings the bell. It's like really cool. Um, usually when I want to start prototyping something at the very least, or sometimes even the, the whole final product, I'll use Johnny5. So you know, I'll NPM install Johnny5. Um, it's a JavaScript open source Internet of Things and robotics pre fr uh, programming framework in case you haven't used it before. It's really, really cool. Uh, it has robust reality tested APIs and it's, it, 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 it's supported across like Linux and Windows and OS X. Um, it also has implementations for all sorts of different devices, including the Raspberry Pi. Um, so definitely check it out because it, it supports a lot of different devices. Um, and some of you who saw my talk yesterday will have heard of Fermata.js and they're seeing a crocodile in their heads right now for some reason. And uh, Fermata.js is actually what's underneath Johnny5 and that's what is creating the communication with the Arduino. And so that's kind of what I started with in order to create this. And so it's the JavaScript implementation of the Fermata protocol. Um, and the Fermata protocol is uh, something that exposes the Arduino's pins almost like an API. So you can use your computer to interface with the Arduino without having to repeatedly upload scripts onto the Arduino itself, which is really, really convenient. Um, so I thought, cool, you know, I've got this screen. You know, I want to start like putting things on the screen and experimenting and seeing if showing the time on this screen, you know, looks any good. And it, it turns out there's actually no support for this screen in Johnny5. And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can write my own support for it somehow. You know, I can totally write my own class and then get it merged into Johnny5 and we'll all live happily ever after. And like, how hard can it actually be, right? Everyone asks, you know, everyone thinks that when they first start. And so what actually happened is it kind of became this battle between this screen, which you can show like the hex dead beef on it, by the way, which is great. Um, it became this battle of the screen against me and, and it kind of, started looking like this in my head, and I'm sure this is how it starts for everybody. They start on their JavaScript hardware adventure, and you know, this is, this is actually what happened, by the way. Um, and so you start going through, and you're researching, you're digging through the grass, and you're, you're going on Google, and then like out of nowhere, oh my, something just kind of appears, and you're like, oh god, I wasn't ready for
for this? Like, what, what is happening? I was just Googling around. And a wild data sheet appears, right? Data sheets, they're instructions that are published by device manufacturers to make you feel really dumb, essentially. <laughs> and, and so this is the data sheet for the OLED screen that I, I bought off the internet. Um, I think I bought it off eBay or something like that. And it doesn't really, it's not very user friendly. Um, and at the time I didn't know that this was the clock cycles of the device. And you know, it's going on and on about you know, D slash C and D3 to D7 and I'm, I'm just, uh, it's just not really working out for me. And I didn't really know what was going on. So it turns out that they didn't really win that battle at first. <laughs> and I thought, this is OK. Like, I don't need this cryptic data sheet. I can figure this out like, by myself, right? I don't need it. But I felt really sad because I really, like, this was the first step in my process, and I was already not feeling so great about it. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, I can find a way around this. I'll just like, you know, go exploring through other avenues. And, and oh. This computer just kind of appears, and he's like, how many bits are in a byte? And I'm like, I don't really see how this is relevant, but um, so a byte is a unit of information, right? And it's the size required to encode a single character of text on a computer. And like, I'm pretty sure last time I checked, a, bit contained, a byte contains eight bits, right? And the computer's like, affirmative, you should remember this. And I'm like, okay, like, <laughs> It was cool. Um, but at least I got the answer right this time, you know? I just sort of knew what I was doing, so I was like, cool. You know, this has probably got something to do with the screen. Oh, who is this? And so I keep going on, and apparently this is the spirit of I2C. You know, I2C stands for inter-integrated circuit. So the two is meant to be like superscript, right? It's, oh, it's very funny. Everyone's great in the tech scene at coming up with names. Um, and so with the I2C interface, you can send data in and data out to devices. And I'm like, oh, this, this is going to be like how I'm going to hook up the, the Arduino to the screen. You know, th I've got this, you know. So, so, so how do I do this spirit of I2C? And he says, well, it only uses four wires. And I was like, that's cool, because I've seen some Arduino circuits where you've got about 16 wires like going in and out, you know, and that's really complicated. So he says, well, there's power and there's ground. And I'm like, well, that's pretty, that's pretty standard. There's data in. I was like, cool, I can send data to it. And there's data out. And I was like, oh, I can get something back. This, this seems pretty good. I think I might try and use I2C. Thanks, spirit of I2C. Um, and so for some idiotic reason, I decided to open the data sheet again. <laughs> and, and I saw there's this whole section in figure 8.1.5 uh, about I2C communication. And I was like, yay, OK, I can, I can use this. This is good. I've sorted out the first part of this. And when I went digging through FMATA.js, I saw that it actually has I2C communication support. And I was like, brilliant. Don't even have to write some weird JavaScript layer for that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure that I just use a screen that uses I2C. And the one I bought off eBay actually does support it. Um, it supports two different communication protocols. And this is kind of how you hook it up. So that's your four wires. You've got power and ground on the right to the diagram, and then you've got your data in and data out on the left. And they confusingly cross over in the fritzing diagram. That's just an unfortunate thing about um, circuits and people developing them in isolation. So I was like, all right, this is, this is starting to, to look up for me. You know, I can, I can keep going. And I can actually start like JavaScripting and like creating the, 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 the communication to this device. And, and, and I run into this tree, and there's like a spider web on it. And I'm not great with spiders. And on top of that, there's all these bytes in an array just sitting on it. And I'm like, I do not understand what this has to do with screen. Maybe this is a group of bytes that I need to send to it. And so I'm, I'm like, OK, um, this is actually a buffer. So who's used buffers in Node.js? Yeah, cool. So, you know, buffers, they're, they're, they're another object that you can use. They're not really native to JavaScript. Um, well, not like where you're aware of what it actually is. Uh, you can store raw binary data in them. And, you know, Arduinos in these screens, they, they kind of communicate in binary data. So I was like, all right, this, this is probably what I'm going to have to use. And each item in a buffer is actually a byte. So I was like, OK. And then there's eight bits in a byte. And the computer tested me on that earlier. 
So to create a new buffer, it's simply new buffer, um, but you do have to give it a memory allocation. So you do have to tell it like the size you want that to be. And that's pretty consistent with, um, with creating that down on the C level. So I learned about this concept of a screen buffer, and I was like, okay, they're using the word buffer. This is gonna be pretty similar to each other. And so a screen buffer is actually just an ordinary buffer. Um, it's got lots of bytes in it, and it's actually the pixel data of that screen. And so when you think about it, each byte you know, contains like pixel data in it. So I'm like, how does that exactly map? Like, is it one byte per pixel? Or, or like, you know, how is this OLED chip passing these bytes to display the pixels? And this is an example of a, of a buffer. And I thought, maybe one bit is a pixel. And so I did some calculations and found out that was actually true. But I thought, how do I change the different pixels inside a byte, like I've never actually done that before. And so I'm sort of thinking about it and I see this, this little guy in the corner over there and I'm like, hey, you kind of look like a bit, like what's going on? And he says, I am the loneliest bit. And I was like, okay, I wasn't really expecting this, but all right. Um, he says, I am the tragic victim of a JavaScript bitwise operation. And I was like, wow, okay, I think, uh, I think I'm gonna get this guy's life story for sure. And he's like, this is the, the bitwise operation that, that sealed my fate. And I was like, oh gosh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in, in the least significant byte position and someone came along and they wanted to check the, the, the value of, the, of the, my neighbor and so they, they just did a right logical shift and I just fell off the byte and I, I never saw my friends ever again. And so like, it was useful that he told me that because I'd never done bitwise operations so I kind of learned how to shift in and that was really cool. But what do bitwise operations have to do with talking to devices? Well, you know, I sort of hinted at that before. When you talk to devices, it's just byte curation. You know, you're just trying to put everything in the right format so that the chip will not just miss the message or drop it. It will know exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, and so, you know, bytes are in the value of zero to 255. And you're just trying to figure out the right order to send them in. And this can be really precarious. And if you don't understand your data sheet, then that's very difficult as well. Um, but for example, this byte here actually turns on the display. So you know you can have a byte that corresponds to an, an entire command, which is awesome. Like that's really useful. And if you look in the data sheet, it actually lists those commands in a very cryptic way, but you can figure it out. So I was like, okay, so some bytes turn on the display. Some bytes contain like pixels. Like this, you know, this one here contains eight pixels. And if we're talking about a monochromatic screen, if there's eight pixels and they're, they're all at the value of one, like what color would that be? And it would be white, right, because it's on. And so if that was full of zeros, it would be eight black or off pixels. So I also learned that through a lot of trial and error. Um, and so these, these bytes have a lot of meaning to them. Um, and that's kind of what powers the screen. So I was like, this guy's been like super useful. So I'm really sorry for your loss, but um, you've been really helpful and I've got to go now because I think, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to send some stuff to this device. And he's like, oh, okay. So I was like, okay, so I, I know the communication protocol, I can use Fumata. I kind of have manipulated some pixel data now, you know, I've tried to put a pixel in each corner of the screen. So I've arranged this buffer full of mostly zeros because I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'm ready to like put all the pieces together. So, you know, I got to the final boss battle and I was like, oh God, okay, this is gonna be fine. And it was kind of scary because you know the first time you send a bunch of stuff, it's probably not going to work. But at the same time, you're really like going, but what if it did? Like that would be so amazing. Um, and so I was like, I'm, I'm just going to do it. It's fine. Like no one knows what I'm doing right now at one in the morning when I should be in bed. So I send this byte array to it through Fumata.js 
and uh, nothing really happened. <laughs> so, so three nights later of, of like, okay, no, wait, I got that byte out of sequence, or no, you have to turn the screen off before you send this particular configuration, and then you need to turn it back on again, and then the pixel data. And so it became a bit of a fight, but eventually we actually got somewhere, and I got the word cats displaying, and I also sent it a scroll command, which was cool. You can send all sorts of stuff to the screen. It's actually pretty smart. So that was pretty awesome. Um, and I thought, someone else is probably going to go through this hell. So I thought I would publish it on NPM. So you can actually um, do NPM install OLED JS, and it will come down. And you can actually play with it if you have an OLED screen and an Arduino. Um, it plugs straight into Johnny 5. So um, the author of Johnny 5 and I are talking. We're trying to get it merged in in the next month or so. I just moved to the same city as him. So he's definitely going to be more accessible for me to just sit down and pair program with. So that's going to be super fun. Um, but let's have a look at some advice, like outside of all the silliness, right? Use an Arduino, even if the final device you're you're sort of writing for is not going to be an Arduino. Like, just use one because you'll. It just takes away all of this horribleness that that you have just getting started. It, it's almost like your boilerplate or your bootstrapping, right? So that it's really useful. Um, learn bitwise operation, mo mainly because bare metal computing is actually really interesting. I'd never had an excuse to do this stuff before. You know, I didn't do computer science. I didn't go to college or do any of that stuff and just sort of self-taught. So, you know, this was an opportunity to learn something really cool. Um, don't delete the data sheet, even if it makes you feel really bad about yourself. Um, read it as many times as necessary. So after completing this project, I now actually am able to grok most of that data sheet, and I feel really good about that. And I know the next time I pick up a data sheet, it's going to be ridiculous all over again. But I feel like there'll be some common things that, you know, are between the data sheets. So I think that'll be a lot easier. Um, be comfortable not knowing what you're doing. Like this was one of the, my first project that I picked up and I thought I might actually fail at this, you know. I picked something that I wasn't sure if I could actually pull off. And I think that's actually really important to do in your personal time um, because it, it really does make you turn a corner in how you feel about your own abilities and, and it definitely did for me. Um, so like hardware, it tends to be pretty hard to do. Um, it's getting better because we have these awesome libraries. Um, but hopefully you t find a way to turn it to funware because I'm certainly having a lot of fun doing it. Um, so yeah, um, thanks.